to Your Life Simplified. I'm Valerie Escobar, Certified Financial Planner, joined by the lovely Michael McKelvey, as always, Certified lovely. Financial Planner. Yes. <laughs> Big um, for me. Thank you. How was your lovely weekend? It was lovely as well. No, it was good. <laughs> it was good. Uh, it was warm out here in Seattle. It took me 30 years to realize this, but the reason why the summers feel short is because they're only two months long. Like I used to always think like they're just flying by because they're fun. It's actually just because they're about two months. So we're in that yeah. two month period. I'm feeling good right now. Awesome. Well, good. <laughs> I'm feeling good too because we're talking taxes today. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you have oh, a yeah. tax stance? <laughs> I, I don't actually. Okay. Maybe a tax we'll work avoidance, on that. You tax should avoidance have a tax. stance. <laughs> a little Perfect. bit of a tax okay. avoidance stance. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sweet. Well, we'll talk. Well, we can do that. Ah, this is a, yeah, not so much avoidance perhaps, but strategy wise. Uh, yeah. We're talking tax loss harvesting today. Um, and so this is a little bit in the weeds, but we're going to try and make it simple. Um, as always, ask questions of your advisor to send us emails uh, if you have questions and we can help. But let's jump in. Um, Mike, let's start with the easy, most uh, obvious question. What on earth is tax loss harvesting? Tax loss harvesting. Yeah, I want to change my dance to a strategic tax planning dance in case compliance is listening. But um, tax loss harvesting, this is going to be a little technical here. I'm going to give you a brief line and then we're going to go to an example if that's all right. Because I think you really learn the best way here by application, as is the case many times. Does that sound fair? Perfect. Okay. Lovely, so, even. <clears throat> the process of selling a security at a loss for tax purposes. So you're like, what the heck? Like, why would you ever sell, you know, a security at a loss? Well, sometimes you might do it for tax purposes. So again, I mentioned I learned best by example. So I'm going to start with an example, then we'll get into why you might do this. <clears throat> Let's say that John is in the 24% tax bracket. And John has, at the beginning of the year, bought a $100,000 international index in his taxable account. But let's imagine that that international index has dropped to $93,000 within the year. Sorry, John. To tax loss harvest, John would need to sell that fund, thereby recognizing a $7,000 capital loss. So let's say John now sells it. It's at $93,000. He's got a $7,000 capital loss. Okay. John would then use the proceeds from this sale to purchase, we'll assume, some other fund to replace this international index. Okay, But with this $7,000 capital loss, he can use that to offset any capital gains he, re he realized this year. So if John's capital loss exceeded those capital gains, so let's say you know he had $4,000 in capital gains by selling and recognizing and realizing some other security, he could offset that and not have to worry about that loss or that gain in this case. And he'd be left with still a $3,000 net capital loss, which he could use to offset his ordinary income. Now, why might you do this? Well, again, if John is in the 24% ordinary income bracket, this $3,000 could be used to offset that. Now, again, I mentioned he did this at the beginning of the year, but let's say it was a long-term capital loss that he had. He could take that long-term capital loss to 7,000. Maybe he bought it a year and a half ago and still offset up to 3,000 of his ordinary income within the year. Long-term capital gains brackets are different than ordinary income brackets. Long-term capital gains brackets almost always, uh, if not always, uh, more favorable than ordinary income. So mm -hmm. the point here, at least from a, 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 a first example basis, is John can get a tax benefit by deferring this gain to future years and potentially take advantage of a uh, short-term, uh, uh, sorry, capital gains tax bracket versus uh, having to pay the ordinary income taxes on it, right? So you're essentially choosing right. one or the other. That's one of the reasons you might do it. Now, again, what are some other reasons John might look to do this? We're selling that security at a loss. Why the heck might somebody want to do this, Valerie? 
Right. So another one that um, is pretty common that we use is to offset capital gains, like you said. Um, so let's say that John, you know, he used the the proceeds from selling the international index fund um, and he went and he put it into some other security that he somehow knew was going to just have this amazing uh, shooting star year. Um, quickly made a big gain on that and then sells it. Uh, we don't advise or condone such activities, but uh, in the event that John did this, he realized a short-term capital gain. Um, and let's just say it was a, a $7,000 gain. Um, he can use his losses that he realized on the, the initial sale and then use that to offset the gain. Mm -hmm. So he would have owned ta owed taxes because he made $7,000. He lost seven thousand dollars on the other hand so they offset each other and so now he is not paying any taxes on that at all um and yeah. it kind of mitigates the the tax bracket that he's in um this is usually pretty helpful um because it allows you to stay in the game right so you sold out of one one uh product usually we advise sell, buying into that same sort of product not the exact same one because of wash sale rules um, basically offset, which would offset the, the, the loss that you had um, realized, right. but it allows you to stay in there. You have, so you can continue to make your gains later and then not have to pay the tax on the, on the gain at that point. Right. Yeah. Um, so the benefit there is, you know, in deferral potentially, right? So like the longer you're pushing this out, but we got to make sure we mention that, uh, you know, your, your gain now would theoretically be larger, right? You're, you mm -hmm. have a compounding gain because, you know, his basis now has gone from a hundred to 93, you know, while he is deferring this gain, you know, now if he sells it 130, maybe a few years later, because let's say he bought a replacement, uh, you know, different index that wasn't an international one. He's trying to avoid the wash sale rules. He buys maybe some domestic index and it grows to 130 from 93. Now his basis is at 93. So he has a bigger mm -hmm. tax liability, right? But what you're saying is that that benefit is in the deferral, right? It is in the deferral. And a lot of times, you know, frankly, we are all emotional creatures, right? And so sometimes mm -hmm. if I say, okay, guess what, client, I made you uh, $40,000 in capital gains this year. Uh, instead of celebrating, they'll say, but well, now I have to pay all these taxes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I, true. I am so sorry about that. Luckily, we also lost some money over here. We could offset mm -hmm. the gain. So right now, this year, we're feeling good, uh, not having to pay taxes. We can defer it, kick it down the, kick the can down the road. But then what? Right. So we do yeah. have this. We got to do something with this eventually. Um, yeah. So maybe we yeah. can. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about that. What are we? What are we doing now? Well, yeah. If if nothing else, you know, again, you get that interest free loan essentially from mm -hmm. Uncle Sam. If everything else stays the same. Okay. But, uh, you know, some other things to maybe just consider with this, uh, you know, when might it make sense, uh, versus not, well, you gotta be aware of this wash sale rule, as we mentioned. So you can't buy a, you know, substantially similar, I can't remember the exact IRS definition of it, but it's essentially like a substantially similar, you know, index. You gotta be aware of that within 30 days. Now, if you go from, let's say, uh, some stock that is in tech to maybe some stock that is uh, in healthcare, you know, probably don't have to worry about this, but you do want to make sure you're cognizant of this in case you run into what's called the wash sale rule within 30 days. But I want to touch on maybe when this can make sense and when it gets overhyped, because I will say it gets overhyped a little bit. Um, I see it makes sense uh, sometimes for, uh, you know, folks that maybe are considering uh being you know in a lower income state tax right so if mm -hmm. they're potentially thinking about like retiring in a lower state income tax um you know that that might be beneficial for them to push that deferment to the time where maybe they're retiring in a state that has lower income taxes right um there are some i, I think other periods which i i know you want to touch on too uh, like when this maybe makes sense. But, you know, that's one of them that jumps out to me just being here in Washington. People live in Oregon and they have a high income tax state or California. And then they come to Washington and maybe they're realizing this this gain that they pushed off through tax loss harvesting for a few years. That's maybe one time strategically where it makes sense. 
Mm-hmm. What are some other, I, I do want to touch on like where this maybe doesn't make sense too, but what are some other reasons yeah. or, or, or times where it makes sense, Valerie? Yeah. So years that you don't have lots of income. So we could do gap years or retirement. Um, early retirement especially is great. Uh, if someone's retiring, let's say you retire at 55, uh, you can't touch your IRAs or qualified accounts until you're 59 under more, you know, there's some little secrets about how to do that if, if required, but that's a great opportunity to start realizing some of these gains because if under t- current tax law, uh, that first depending on uh, your filing, um, how, you, how you're filed, if you're married, if you file jointly, et cetera, you can realize up to a certain amount of dollars uh, in capital gains without paying any taxes at all. So let's say I have a married couple uh, and they have big capital gains that they haven't touched and need to do something with eventually. I'll tell them, let's go ahead and we're going to realize $80,000 worth of that because you're not you're in that 0% capital gains tax bracket right mm-hmm. now. Uh, so I think that that's always a really important that's time a great to, point. to use that. Yeah. I mean, that's a great point. And, um, you know, again, like some things that help this lots of volatility. I mentioned you want to be wary here because I will say it's like every fund company seems obligated to offer this service. Uh, a lot of advising companies too. We actually have, uh, an opportunity to help clients out with this too. Um, and, and reason why I want to bring this up is like, you really want to pay close attention to the assumptions. Anytime you see tax alpha, that's like, touting some crazy return and understand that there are some things that definitely help this so like volatility helps this so anytime Mm -hmm. you're looking into the assumptions of you know hey we promise to give you you know tax alpha hopefully they're not promising but you know we we uh we think we can get a tax alpha historically of one to two percent you know um pay close attention to the assumptions in that case. Uh, if they're using periods of time where there's more volatility, that helps it, uh, it because when there's more volatility, there's more opportunity to capture more losses. Um, so again, I, I, I would just understand that like, this isn't as clear cut as it seems where it's just like, oh, you know, I'm looking at my portfolio, I buy this stock and I change it for this stock and it always makes sense because I don't have to pay the taxes this year. Um, There might be transaction costs to do that if you're doing this Mm -hmm. on your own. Uh, There might be portfolio allocation liabilities uh, in the long run if you're just chasing tax savings. And over time, you're like, wait a second, now I'm just, you know, I'm sitting here with this overweighted portfolio just doesn't make sense for me anymore. Right. Um, So you don't want to let that tax, uh, you know, tail wag, if you will, the rest of your overall financial fundamentals. Right. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's always, you know, getting carried away with taxes and the idea of, you know, trying to avoid them is always something that we're going to struggle with. Um, yeah. I love to come up with the solutions when possible. Uh, as you mentioned, we do have a product here at Mariner that does that internally. Um, it, and it works with individual stocks, uh, which I think is a really nice way to do tax loss harvesting, because when you have your individual stocks, you really get to control when you're going to realize gains. Yeah. Um, you know, mutual funds and things will do distributions when they choose that it's best for them. Um, yeah. But with our clients, you know, it will have many, many hundreds of uh, stocks that'll be in there. Um, there is an algorithm internally that says, okay, when this drifts and, you know, there's a 10% right. loss on this stock, that's when we're going to be able to sell it. And then we'll replace it with a handful of other stocks or yeah. um, that are similar, loosely but not speaking, right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Loosely speaking. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, a, definitely a, a good opportunity out there. And with individual stocks, understand that like, you really need to have a, a little bit larger portfolio in order mm-hmm. to do that effectively. Um, one of the things I see is like people will have, you know, maybe a hundred thousand, a couple hundred thousand dollars in a portfolio and they'll have like 10 stocks, uh, maybe not like the epitome of uh, diversification and they're chasing these, these tax savings. And it's like, okay, well it gets, it's a lot harder when you don't have enough money to properly diversify in the portfolio. So that's maybe where you're looking at funds, uh, to do this for you, but yeah. still, um, yeah, you're right. Like, uh, having individual securities allows you to be more strategic with this. Um, any other thoughts you had on it? Uh, anything else you want to touch on? I think just, you know, this is one of our tax year end to do's, uh, which will have a whole episode on that, but that is certainly one of the things that we do for clients is just make sure that, if there is opportunity to do tax loss harvesting, that we get those done by year end and 
um, really be strategic uh, about how it's done. And again, this is can be done a DIY type of thing. Um, yeah. But it can be tricky. <laughs> and so yeah. luckily we have our team to, to be able to do that. For I us. mean, it's it's so subjective to your situation. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you have right. a big capital gain coming up that you know about, you're selling something in a couple of years, you're getting some large capital gain. It's like you may, might want to carry forward some losses to really offset that if you're going to be in this really high bracket or something. Right. So, again, very subjective to your situation. Great insights, Valerie. Um, hopefully everybody that listened to this found it helpful. I know it was a little technical today, but sometimes we got to get technical if we're going to find some opportunity. Uh, my name, Michael McKelvey. This is your life simplified. Valerie had fun today. Thanks for having me on. If you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify, YouTube, wherever you might be listening, make sure to subscribe so you get more industry insights from industry professionals. You guys take care. Thanks, Mike. All right, see you next time. Mariner Wealth Advisors, or MWA, is an SEC-registered investment advisor with its principal place of business in the state of Kansas. Registration of an investment advisor does not imply a certain level of skill or training. MWA is in compliance with the current notice filing requirements imposed upon registered investment advisors by those states in which MWA maintains clients. MWA may only transact business in those states in which it is notice filed or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from notice filing requirements. Any subsequent direct communication by MWA with a prospective client shall be conducted by a representative that is either registered or qualifies for an exemption or exclusion from registration in the state where the prospective client resides. For additional information, about MWA, including fees and services, please contact MWA or refer to the Investment Advisor Public Disclosure website at www.advisorinfo.sec.gov. Please read the disclosure statement carefully before you invest or send money. The views expressed in this podcast is for educational purposes only and do not take into account any individual personal, financial, legal, or tax considerations. As such, the information contained herein is not intended to be personal, legal, investment, or tax advice. Nothing herein should be relied upon as such, and there is no guarantee that any claims made will come to pass. The opinions are based on information and sources of information deemed to be reliable, but Mariner Wealth Advisors does not warrant the accuracy of the information. Asset allocation diversification is a strategy designed to manage risk, but it cannot ensure a profit or protect against a loss in a declining market. Certified Financial Planner, trademark, CFP, registered trademark, and federally registered CFP with flame design, marks, collect the CFP registered marks are professional certification marks granted in the United States by Certified Financial Planner Board of Standards, Inc., also CFP Board. The CFP registered trademark certification is a voluntary certification. No federal or state law or regulation requires financial planners to hold the CFP certification.